Welcome to Decoding the Creative, a show about the hopes and hang-ups of the artistic journey and how they coalesce to impact the individual. In this episode, we explore the lessons we've learned after a year of pandemic insanity, and we contemplate the future of the arts as society returns to relative normalcy. And a bit of housekeeping, if you're enjoying our show, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Decoding the Creative, all one word. We post related content regularly, and we share updates on future shows there as well. So, without further delay, this is Episode 7, Reflections and Resolutions. Okay, we are back with Episode 7. Today we'll be reflecting on the lessons we've learned over the past year during the pandemic and how this strange moment has left an indelible mark on the arts in different ways. But before that, let's talk about our sources of inspiration. So, Ben, what is inspiring you lately? So... I'm really excited about this one. This one was really cool. Um, so I got off of work um, this past week and went to the local record shop that was um, not too far from my house. It's like about 10 minutes or so, but I always check it out. Super cool record shop. You know, I like to buy local when I can. And for people that go to like a record shop, they can probably relate. I don't know if you go to record shops a lot right now, Ray, but um, when you go in, like I'm always expecting to like spend at least like, I don't know, 30 minutes in there or something. Because I got my like budgeted out, you know, set of money that I'm going to spend, and that's what I like to keep it at. So I go in, you know, expecting to spend like 30 minutes, you know, looking through everything. Lo and behold, first section I go to, I find Between the Buried and Me's Alaska album, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" So if you're a metalhead or if you ever listen to heavy music, Between the Buried and Me came out with this album. What like? What was that like 2009, I think, 2010, yeah, somewhere around there? I don't know. Yeah, somewhere around there. But that music, that band that they came out with on that album just changed the game for me. And I know a lot of my friends around me, a lot of my bandmates, you included, Ray. I know you were, you know, geeking out on the album there for a bit as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah, so the fact that, you know, I've kind of turned into a vinyl, a vinyl head right now and um, I love collecting albums that I listened to when I was growing up and that one was a huge one for me. So I've basically, I listened to that album earlier this week when I got it and now I've just been kind of going down the rabbit hole of the, <laughs> of the rest of their music, which the rest of their music is just absolutely insane and super inspirational to me and makes me realize that I have a lot of work to do as a drummer. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, you know, looking for vinyl is, uh, it's like a treasure hunt. Basically, you just got to dig and find what you find. And sometimes you find mm -hmm. weird stuff, and sometimes you find real gems like that. And yeah, the Alaska album was really formative. I just Googled it because I, that whole era of time is just a blur to me, but it actually came out in mm -hmm. 2005. Whoa, I did not know it came out that late. Are it just you serious? Yeah, which, I mean, you know, BT Bam just was ruling the scene. I mean, really from like 2005 till mm -hmm. onward, you know. But it, yeah. it, it's crazy how influential that was for people in that style. Everybody was really being inspired. I mean, there was like <laughs> new, new guitar techniques, like mm -hmm. songwriting stuff. I mean, basically the entire, every angle you can take with heavy music they were making an impact on every angle at the same time. Yeah, and it was weird because I think, you know, going back and I was listening to the album and I love seeing if it still holds, you know, holds its weight like it did when when I first listened to it and was first digging it and listening to it. I think the the cool thing about that album was they weren't, <clears throat> if you think about it, they weren't, the, some of the techniques, yeah, they were introducing new techniques and new, you know, they, but they were basically piecing things that have already been done yeah um and they were piecing them in together in ways though that no one truly had ever done and i think a lot of people have wanted to do maybe crazy spastic stuff that's on that album because it really is an all over the place album yeah <clears throat> and i think that you know people are back then at that you know especially 2005 i didn't know it went back that far but they were afraid to kind of jump on to these weirder elements because it wasn't commercial enough, you know, it might not get them that, you know, that play, you know, load that they want to get. Um, but I think between the Barry and me on that album, I think just the sheer talent, if they were like, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And I think that's what made everybody want to listen to that album because even if they didn't like it, they wanted to hear yeah. the crazy stuff they were doing. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. They were committed to it. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ray? What's one that you got? 
So, um, got a few. Um, one of them is the uh, post rock band Hubris. That's H U B R I S, period. You know, mm-hmm. because bands got to be weird with their names. I love, <laughs> I love that the, the band has a punctuation mark in their name. You have, and if you, you got to have the punctuation you got mark. To, That's it's not the right. Thing. They have mm-hmm. two great albums. One's called Metempsychosis, and the other one's called Apocryphal Gravity. Um, I really like Apocryphal Gravity. Uh, it's really inspiring. It's great. It's the perfect level of musical intensity for you to kind of listen and be engaged while you're doing other stuff, whether you're writing or whether you're like doing housework, it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's just enough without overloading the senses. Cause mm-hmm. I do like a lot of like instrumental metal, but if you're, if you're trying to uh, like write some fiction, you can't be listening to Polyphia and they're like blasting your ear. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta take the next tier down in terms of the insanity level. And it's mm-hmm. just the a hubris. Those that past two albums by them are perfect, um, and they're they got they have a lot of melodic, you know, segments, and they have a lot of dynamic segments, and it's just really great stuff all around. So if anybody's looking for something, it's not background music per se because it's not boring. That's not to say mm-hmm. it's not elevated okay. music, right? It is well crafted music that is perfect to just kind of synthesize into your daily life. I love those bands that can create like a soundscape. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whether it's instrumental or even if they have vocals. Um, but yeah, I do love having those artists that you can find when you want to just be creative or just kind of relax, but you don't want to like, you don't want to listen quote unquote to music. You just want to have it playing to help, you know, make the mood, I guess, and the environment. Exactly. All right. Give me another one of your inspirations. So I've been, uh, really back into reading. I go back and forth with reading. Um, and so I'm on a kick where I started reading the second book by Mark Hansen. And for the sake of uh, censorship, I guess, it's called Everything is Screwed. But you know where I'm getting nice. at with what it's called. Um, it, but it's really cool because it's um, a continuation of sorts to his first book that he came out with. And I highly recommend it if you want something that's really kind of very cheeky at times. Um, you know, it's funny, but at the same time, he is packing some really good knowledge and takeaways and, you know, stuff that can kind of help you with your everyday life. Um, This particular book is talking more about the aspect of hope and how humans are completely drawn to hoping for stuff. And if we don't hope for anything, if you really think about it, we're always hoping for something. If you took that away, you know, humans have lost a really big part of themselves. And one of the really cool takeaways so far, I'm not, I'm only what, like three or four chapters in, I think at this point, but so far the really big takeaway I've taken from it. Um, was he talks about how your brain is, in theory, two different brains. A thinking brain that's logical, you know, it looks at, you know, all the facts, everything that's in front of it uh, to judge the situation. And then you have your feeling brain, which is obviously the, you know, impulses and the emotions and the heart, per se. Um, And he talks about how your, in real life, your feeling brain is basically what's driving the car or your life, per se. And... He talked about a really cool way to sometimes um, get your thinking brain to take over, especially, say, if you're um, trying to change a habit, you know, lose weight. Maybe you're trying to keep yourself from eating something unhealthy or doing a habit that's not good for you or something like that. A lot of us tell, you know, try to, you know, argue with our feeling brain and tell it, hey, we're not going to do this. And obviously your feeling brain's like, well, I want to do this. So cool. That's what we're going to do because I'm driving this car. But if your thinking brain, if you try to use your thinking brain to um, kind of barter with your feeling brain yeah. and say, hey, think about if you didn't do it, think about all the other things that would happen as benefits if you did do this. And then once your feeling brain starts thinking about those different things, it goes, well, hey, that is cool. Even though it would be nice to continue doing this one thing, what you're mentioning, that would be neat to have. And then your thinking brain starts basically bartering with your feeling brain and says, hey, let's try not to do this habit so that way you can reward yourself with this better lifestyle or this reward of some other sort. Um, so that's been really cool. You know, like I said, he's really funny. He's really sarcastic, but um, he has a lot of really cool life lessons that I've been super digging on lately. That's awesome. Yeah. That reminds me of um, what one of my favorite authors, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he refers to it as the experiential self versus the narrative self. Basically mm-hmm. like, um, and he has uh, he has an episode of uh, the podcast Armchair Expert with Dax Shepard where they talk about this and they give the example of like sitting down and scrolling through Instagram for hours 
in the experiential self, you're having a good experience. You're just having fun. But then mm-hmm. the narrative self, you're telling yourself the story of like, man, I'm lazy. All I did was lay around and scroll through Instagram. So there are two selves, right? There's a self that experiences the moment. And then there's this self that tells a narrative, a story about yourself and the larger like meanings and implications of that. And like, you have to really juggle both of those. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, if you're eating something, like let's say you're eating a lot of food that's really unhealthy, the experiential self is having a good time with that in the moment, but the narrative self is like ashamed or embarrassed or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you do have to find some way to reconcile the two. And I think that's interesting stuff to think about, you know? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Because, um, you know, we're creatures of habit and we're also yeah. creatures of impulse and those two things come together and, you know, it's really hard to change habits and also change the way you react to certain impulses. So. Yeah. I'm always interested in things that talk about that. Oh, I agree. I've got two somewhat writing related ones. Uh, inspirations. Yeah, shoot. Uh, so one, the podcast by KM Wyland. Um, she hosts a podcast called Helping Writers Become Authors. And it's really great stuff because it is very succinct and concise. I mean, an episode may be seven or 12 or 15 minutes. And she just hits you with some great writing advice. And it's not too dense. You don't feel like you have to sit down and take notes the entire time. You can just cut it on and listen and kind of absorb the knowledge. And it's really great stuff without being too academic. It is just the perfect level of density for my brain when I'm doing other activities. Nice, uh, so that's a nice. great, great podcast resource. Another one is I've been kind of browsing through two books by the author, Matt Ruff. He has a book called 88 names and a book called Lovecraft country, which was recently made into an HBO series. And both of these I just, I think it's really great to look, I don't care what kind of art you make. I don't care if you write, I don't care if you make music. You should be able to pull what I call comparables. That is comparable works for your, if you're writing a metal album, you should be able to tell me what three artists it's going to be like. There's no shame in that. Oh yeah. Yeah. uh, Musicians in particular get into the thing where they almost feel like they can't admit being like another artist. And I'm like, nah, you Mm -hmm. have, you have peers, you have, uh, colleagues in your craft and it's okay for you to know that you are comparable to them. That is actually good because it shows that you understand what you're doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I hate that conversation. Of, oh, we, we don't like to put a genre on ourselves. Well, you know, there's a genre on yourself. <laughs> so let's stop, let's stop saying that. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the writing world with me, I always feel like it's important when I'm, when I'm trying to work on a writing project from like writing a book, I try to pull three or four books, put them in a stack and say, between these three or four, that's the vibe I'm going for. Now, I'm mm. not copying them, but I know that whatever I'm working on should fit into this collection, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And and I think having that sense of being able to say that you you fall into a larger context, that's important. Like, you got to have that introspection to know where you fall stylistically or, or what have you. Yeah, and it helps you. It also helps you have a roadmap, you know, of sorts to take yeah, exactly. when you're going down. You know, and there's nothing wrong, like you said, with having a roadmap or you know a pre can you know a pre made kind of path to to you know reference to when you're going down. You know, whether it's making a song or you know writing a book or doing something else. Yeah, I think you should embrace the fact that someone pioneered that and kind of gives you a blueprint, and you can you know, navigate it a little bit differently if you want, but at the same time, you know what direction you're going to with the genre that you're choosing. Oh, absolutely. And so that's why I've been kind of browsing through those books. I read them a while ago. I read 88 Names in December. I read Glovecraft Country like two or three years ago. And But just pulling them off my shelf and flipping through them helps me know that my work exists in a larger context. I just think that's really cool. That is really neat. That's cool, man. Lots of good inspirations that we've had this week. I love it. Oh, yeah. So on to the main topic at hand. The past year during the pandemic has been really, really odd. And I want to pay um, homage to the fact that a lot of people have had terrible years. People have lost loved ones. People have been sick. People have mm-hmm. lost jobs. And, and nothing we say here is meant to minimize that because we know there are always larger battles to fight. However, we can recognize, since we occupy the creative space, that it has impacted the creative space in a unique way. And Mm so today on this episode, we've only mentioned the pandemic in passing during past episodes. We do want to reflect in depth as the pandemic seems to wane. It's not over, but it's getting better. More people are getting vaccinated and and the season's changing. You know, we're going from winter to spring. It almost feels like hope is thawing out, right? Yeah, very true. uh, So in that light, as things seem to be getting better, we want to reflect on the lessons we learned from the past year of being in quarantine, being in lockdown, whatever, and then our hopes for the future as things go back to normal, if they go back to normal, 
what will we see and what do we want to see? So, I mean, when it comes to the past year, what are your, like, what have you learned or what have you gleaned uh, regarding creativity or, or the creative arts, you know, during the pandemic? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, a big one that came about, I'd say, in, I guess if you summarize the big one, was learning how to um, deal with a lack of motivation and also dealing with that lack of motivation in an isolating, you know, setting, um, especially when lockdown happened. Um, we went to lockdown, you know, again, we've mentioned it in previous episodes, but, you know, I think every creative person, musician, writer, anyone in general, you know, thought that when lockdown happened, okay, this is probably something that's going to last for just a couple of months and then it's going to kind of pass. Yeah. Um, and then it didn't. And then everyone, started freaking out a little bit more um, because then that's when stuff really starts setting in that you have to, you're going to be in this for the long haul. Yeah. Um, so when everything started kind of getting shut down and, you know, myself and my girlfriend and um, her mom and, you know, all of her family started staying in, um, you know, there was, you weren't hanging out with your bandmates and your friends, you know, yeah. now you're not hanging out with the people that you love creating with. Uh, performing wasn't happening, you know, for me is a big one. I thrive on the performance aspect of being a musician. And, um, you know, also because I wasn't performing anywhere, what, you know, what's the point of practicing, you know, yeah. on top of social distancing and, you know, trying to be safe and not intermingle, you know, now you're not really practicing and whether that be with your bandmates or whether that be at home. So dealing with that lack of motivation in an isolating setting uh, was a really, really big challenge that I had to deal with. But I think, honestly, doing stuff like this, honestly, this podcast, when yeah. you brought this podcast to my attention and was like, hey, I really want to do this, and it's something that I wanted to do, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, I, I, it was like, that's awesome, because I've always kind of dabbled in wanting to do a podcast as well, but I've always used the excuse of, Hey, I'm working on my music. Yeah. I'm working on this band project or whatever to not, you know, to justify that I didn't really have time to delve into it. And, um, I didn't want to half ass it, you know, per se, yeah. if I was going to do it. So, but during the pandemic, what else was I doing? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. when you brought that to my attention, that really gave me a spark of, Hey, this is something I've never done before, but I need to get out of this, you know, lack of motivation. You know, I need to really energize myself and challenge myself that even though this isn't an avenue that I don't normally, you know, find creativity in, yeah. you know, let's find it here. Let's do it. Because the only other scenario you're going to have is you're just going to continue to wallow in being sad that you're not doing anything. Yeah. So uh, that was a big one for me. Yeah. And it's funny because what you just said hits on really both of them. As I was contemplating this, both the points that I wrote down which is that, like, number one, when you have this discussion about lack of motivation, um, I think it's all a lot of that's also tied up in, like, ambition and, and self-care. And what I've seen is over the past year, there's been a lot of pressure inside. Like, obviously, creative folks, we pressure ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of creative people over the past year who have pressured themselves to accomplish a lot during a tough year. They're like, this is the year you write your book. This is the year you record your album from home. And there have been a lot of people where they've pitted their ambition against their self-care where they're like, my motivation is lacking. Uh, I'm sick. I lost my job, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world's melting down around me, but I really feel this pressure that I should be writing an album or writing a book or starting a thing. And if you didn't do that, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can't let ambition be poisonous, right? Mm -hmm. We can't let ambition be like self-destructive. And I think that that's really dangerous, especially when you start to mix in like social isolation and lack of opportunities, because that's already been bad for people's mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, very true. And I do think, you know, on point number two, you know, you're talking about this podcast. Uh, I think the larger lesson for me over the past year is that the new media is essential. I used to feel a little bittersweet about new media, that is podcasts, streaming, YouTube, TikTok, all that stuff, I felt like, nah, l let's keep the stage, let's keep the live performance, we, we need to push this other stuff to the side, but I think this past year has shown you that the new media is essential, and it really has helped us, like, we have to respect the fact that, um, you know, video games and podcasts and all of that has kept us sane this past year, mm -hmm. when we, none of us could go to concerts, most of the time, none of us could go to a movie, like, we have to be grateful 
for the creators that kept us sane yeah. when we were stuck in our house in October, November, December, and all we had was our, our phone in our hand or our laptop, and that's all we could do. We have to really re- appreciate the the uh, necessity of new media, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had like, you know, we had David Stanley on video game creator last yeah. episode, you know, people like him that, you know, they, that's what they do. That's their medium of creation. Yeah. And they were lucky in a sense that they didn't have their, you know, medium affected as severely um, as like say musicians or performing artists or, you know, that where that's 100% their, their world. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you got to give kudos to people like David and other video uh, game creators, other content creators that, you know, that was their goal the whole time yeah. was to keep you entertained when you're at home in the comfort of your own home or when you're out on the road or whatever the case may be. And you need to just pass the time. I love it. You know, I love that they've had a, t- a time to shine per se in this, you know, it yeah. is a little a little glimmer of positivity throughout this uh, really negative year that we've had this past year. Yeah. And it's, it's really shown me that there are still frontiers, you know, sometimes it feels like all the things that could have been created have been created. But mm-hmm. even now I can see now over the past year that there are still creative frontiers to push the needle forward and try new things. Uh, you know, online through any kind of digital platform, digital spaces have shown that there are still places where you can innovate. Innovation is not dead. All the ideas have not been taken, right? There are still frontiers that we can, uh, that we can explore. Yeah. Because you didn't really have any choice, you know, you had to innovate, you know, and I think that was what uh, stimulated so much rapid innovation in so many different fields. You know, we're talking about the creative world, but even if you look at outside of that, you know, so you know, the online market with shopping and delivery and this, oh, yeah. that, and the other. Um, but yeah, in the creative world, especially, you had to innovate. What else was there to do? You couldn't justify, oh, we're innovating, but we're going at our own pace because we're trying to make sure we this, that, and the other, you know, we're on tour, whatever the case. Yeah. You had you didn't have any of the excuses to not innovate and not progress with what you were doing. You had to change up the way you were delivering your content. Yep. Um, if you were normally a performing artist that was out in front of people, you had to figure something out. Um, some people hit the nail on the head and they figured it out. Some are still tr- trying to figure it out. Yeah. I know, like we talked about before, my band has not really went down that avenue because we, if we were going to do it, we want to do something cool and we just really haven't you know, hit the nail on the head with how we do that. Yeah. With that being said, innovation and exploring a new frontier is quite an undertaking. You know, Mm -hmm. you're like, it is, if you're like, you know, if you're in a band and you're like, I think we should completely renovate our digital experience. Okay. That that's a lot of work, man. That's a lot of work. Yeah. And how are you going to balance it with everything else you got going on right now? Exactly. You know, especially if you're a band like my band who most of the members have full-time jobs and families, you know, we're not a band where this is all we do. So yeah, absolutely. Now with, so, you know, we, we have learned these lessons. Now, what are we hoping for going forward as the pandemic madness recedes and as the, uh, the winter, you know, uh, defrosts here, like I, I see concerts are starting to book. I see mm-hmm. com- comedians and stand up specials are starting to book uh, events. Now they're, mm-hmm. they're starting to book in like August and September. So mm-hmm. what are we hoping for? going forward once this season of, of isolation is over? Um, a big one, you know, like I said, live art, you know, live performing is a huge aspect of my creat- creativity and creative passions. And yeah. what I'm hoping for is that everyone continues to be safe, um, you know, use caution as we do this transition back into some normalcy. And I'm hoping that that happens in a, you know, steady and not rapid, you know, try and flip the switch and say that everything's back to normal. That's just not how this is supposed to go, in my opinion. Um, But I'm hoping that everything goes the way it's supposed to, that, you know, people start using caution and they start thinking a little bit differently when they start going out to live events, you know, just, yeah. just be a little bit more cautious and be a little bit more sanitary. If anything else, for, yeah. <laughs> if, if anything, just, you know, carry some hand sanitizer. Um, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and what I think I'm really hoping for is when live performances come back, I, I really hope that people notice 
what they took for granted. Yes. And even myself, you know, I, I love going to live concerts. I love going to live music, but I, you know, can't sit here and say that I've ever, you know, done extra work besides, you know, go to a show yeah. or if I was booking a show, you know, obviously I did my contractual obligations and gave the venue their cut or whatever, but it's never really gone past that. Now that I haven't had, you know, a place to go see a show, yeah. you know, I've had venues that I really support and love close down. And even in the midst of trying to raise money to save the place, I found myself donating to those causes, which I've never done before. You know, I've never yeah. thought about what would happen if this venue closed down because I've always had it there. So I really hope that people don't take it for granted when it does come back and that people support it and they appreciate it. If you go to a venue, don't destroy it. You know, don't <laughs> treat the people like crap. Don't treat the bartenders like trash. Yeah. You know, treat, you know, treat everybody with respect. And this is artists included. You know, when you go to a place, when you go to a venue, look around when you step into that venue, no matter what it looks like, and just appreciate the fact that this establishment is here and is able to let you do what you love to do. And I'm really hoping that even on like a government side, that that kind of stuff, you know, reflects in that as well. And that performance art and the arts in general, museums, all that stuff are really looked at as essential pieces of what we need as humans in our lives. Oh, so I'm very hoping for that. And there's just a big appreciation and sense of performance uh, importance on the performance arts. Yeah, I agree. I, that's, that's one of the, one of the notes I made for myself too, mm -hmm. as, uh, as I mused over this, I, I hope for a revitalized live performance scene. I hope that this um, gives us some perspective. So we realize how much we do appreciate those things. And then actually, I hope it causes an uptick in attendance. You know, I hope a year from now, concerts are more packed than they have been as long as it's safe because mm -hmm. people know what they missed. Because I think we were all a little jaded prior to this lockdown that we just had concerts on top of concerts, live events on top of live events, always so many options. And mm -hmm. I hope that now this gives us some perspective. And I agree with what you were saying about when people go into these venues from now on, I hope they have a sense of mindfulness that they that they that they truly absorb their moment and they're present in the moment and they're not just mm -hmm. going through the motions and they realize when you step into a, a concert venue for the first time after all this I hope you I hope everyone goes wow I can't believe I get to to be a part of this again That's very true that's a big one and I am waiting for that <laughs> I'm waiting for that moment I I know I've had a few friends that have kind of I think there's been some like more acoustic kind of concerts that have been happening in our area Yeah but nothing truly like venue, I guess, like venue worthy, I suppose. So I can't wait for that to happen, to have that moment where I walk back into a venue and go, oh, I love this place. <laughs> you know, I really hope I never lose you again. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that as we move forward we're, and we start to populate these live performance spaces and even things like band practices or, or like any kind of like I know with with school systems, the arts programs have basically most of them have been just shut down and yeah. a lot of the athletics programs too, but not, not as much. The arts have just been quenched in many ways. And so uh, I hope that we can go forward and appreciate them. And then also remember our appreciation for the digital spaces. You know, I don't want us to abandon those things. I don't want everybody to leave their homes and start going to concerts and stand up, you know, uh, events and just forget about the creators that really, you know, gave it their all to keep us all sane during this time. So I want us to yeah. keep an eye on the past and keep an eye on the future. You know, we have yeah. to, we have to hold both things at once. And yeah, have, you know, you have the, you have the appreciation for the creators that were able to shine throughout the pandemic more so than when it's not, when it wasn't happening. Yeah. But at the same time, don't use them as a backup for when things go wrong. Right. You know, like they need to integrate, you need to give them the appreciation and the continued support so that they can keep creating. Yep. Just like you're going to do when live music comes back and you're going to give them your support in what they're creating. Um, you know, you're going to go to stand-ups or photo exhibits or museums. Yeah. Um, you know, you can give all that your support. And that was one thing that I put down Ray as well as a note was I am very excited to see the overflowing of creativity that we're about to have coming back out into the world. I'm yeah. excited to see what happens. I'm excited to see people pay attention to it. And what I'm hoping is that it's not just, you know, like a fad, like everything else and people pay attention to it, 
you know, really hard. And then they kind of start losing interest and going back to being jaded like they like we were before the pandemic. That's what I'm hoping doesn't happen. Right. Um, and good, good gracious, if us not having that stuff for a year does not teach us to do that, then I don't know what we need to teach us to do not right. do yeah. that. You know, I really don't because I've I've seen you know people that work in those industries. I have friends who work in those industries, and they haven't been able to work since this has happened. And, you know, you see people, again, everyone's situation is different and not, you know, I definitely have not been trying to be insensitive to certain um, situations I've heard, you know, but when I, I see a little bit more minor concerns brought up um, as huge complaints, I think about the people that I know that, hey, they're legitimately not able to work. Like this yeah. was their job. Like yep. this space was what they did for a living and they can't do anything else except go and try and what find a job at a fast food place or a grocery store, you know, because those are the places that are really thriving right now with people not able to go out. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's I'm really hoping that people, um, you know, again, just keep paying attention to that and appreciate the overflowing of creativity because those people having their jobs back, you know, that just goes beyond creativity. Like they get their livelihood back. Yeah, so. That's right. Yeah, I, I definitely, I want to see, you know, really, if my dream were to come true, I want to see a renaissance in the arts. After all of this, I would love to see a boom, not just a return to normalcy, but I want people to create more, do more. I want I want to see a revitalization altogether. Um, oh, yeah. The energy, the quantity, everything. And, and I guess for me, I also want to see further innovation. I mean, for example live podcast recordings in front of a live audience was was growing as as a craft as a thing to do prior to this and then this all shut it down so that's a great example of how new media and the old ways were kind of merging and synthesizing together and coming up with new innovative methods and then this crashed it right the yeah. crashed it yeah. those dived it so as we go forward i want to see enthusiastic participation and I want to see innovation and I want to, I want to try and be a part of that too. Right. Mm -hmm. It's yes. just a question of how. Yeah. Yeah. And I really think there's, and I hope that this is another thing that happens is just everyone has a sense of discovery, yes. you know, with, you know, with creativity, um, discovery and in creating initially, uh, discovering and going out and appreciating creative things, you know, in a live aspect, or still appreciating the discovery of finding stuff online and through digital mediums. Yeah. Um, I also, like we just said, the discovery of how to integrate those two things and innovate further. Um, so I think that's a big thing that I hope happens as well is just a sense of discovery um, that people are just curious and yeah. they want to add that into their creativity. Yeah. So as we conclude this reflection, I guess part mm -hmm. of, part of my thought process is, how am I going to be a part of this? What is my mm -hmm. resolution? Because I can talk all I want about what I want to see, but I need to think about how do I fit into this process, right? So, yeah. so I, I think about resolutions for artists. And I, wanna, I really want to encourage any creative people who listen to this that as the world changes around you and as the pandemic recedes and becomes a part of our history books instead of our lives, uh, ask yourself, what is my resolution? What is my place in this? And so... I, I want to discuss that for a moment. For me, my yeah. resolution going forward is to be a better consumer, to be a better attendant. Like uh, for so long, I think I was not mindful of how I was absorbing creative content. Um, so, you know, the, you know, that uh, the old uh, saying, I believe it was from Gandhi that says, you know, uh, be the change you want to see in the world. Yeah. For creative people, I would task you like, be the audience you want to see in the world. You ever wonder mm. why, uh, local shows don't have an audience well be the audience like, exactly and, and or or be the attendant or be the consumer i've tried to for example listen to podcasts from people i know more because i was absorbing only podcast content from like huge companies right yeah and, and that's great because they are putting they're doing great stuff too but i think we do have to be very mindful and intentional to be better consumers because we need to start that trend, right? Creative folks need to be the ones leading in the way in terms of conscientiously absorbing and, and um, consuming the content instead of just begging everybody else to, right? Yeah, and and, and stop trying to form, uh, I guess, like clicks per se. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, everybody is there for the same reason. If whether 
no matter what event or creative outlet that you're at, you know, you're all there for the same reason. So whether you're the creator and it just doesn't happen to be your stage that night, you know, be there, be there and support yeah. the other creative things that are happening. Like you said, be the audience that you want to have yourself, because if you're not willing to do that, well, you can't, you can't blame it if it happens to you. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So then the question to you, Ben, is what are you going to do? What's your role? What do you see as your resolution as things change and we, we go back to a new normal? Like what, what do you see as your, your place in that? Yeah. I mean, big thing, like you said, um, that's a part of it. I definitely want to be, um, more mindful of how I consume things. I want to give the appreciation where appreciation is due. So that way, even if one person's catching on because I told them about a certain artist or a certain painting or a certain photographer or something like that, hey, I got them one more set of eyes on their work that they didn't have before. Uh, instead of just appreciating appreciating it and then you know not telling anybody about it, you know, I really want to be mindful of spreading the word about when I see fantastic work and not keep it into myself and just be like, oh, I'm really happy that I found it and super underground and, you know, not a whole lot of people know about it yet. Like, I don't want to be that anymore. So yeah. I definitely want to give the appreciation to artists uh, on all platforms, to other people when I see something that truly deserves to be uh, called out and given a shout out and given that attention. And another thing that I feel like I need to do um, when we get back to you know, a little bit better go of things with live music and live events and all that happening again is I want to make sure I challenge myself to always find purpose and meaning in my art, despite feeling like there's no other reason to create, um, always find an origin and a motivation and, you know, beat those lack of motivation moments. So then if I work on myself to better those parts of myself, I can bring it out to other people and help them when they're feeling like they just don't have a lack, you know, any purpose of creating, um, you know, the venues that close down, if they are finding ways to come back, you know, I want to, you know, motivate those people that are trying to bring them back because I'm like, Hey, I know what it's like to not be able to create in your aspect. You're not able to run the venue that you want to run and you don't, you're not able to provide live music the way you want to provide it. Um, so, you know, working on myself, making sure I keep myself in check to always find purpose and meaning in my art and then pass that on to other people in whatever avenue that they're trying to create in, whether it's, you know, like I said, booking a show, or whether it's painting or photography or cooking or writing a book. If they feel like they're having lack of motivation, use the lessons that I've learned through this pandemic and what I'm continuing to work on myself to help them go as well and continue to be better. Absolutely. I think mm -hmm. the best moments and the most challenging work are still ahead of us. And so as we yeah, go forward, very true. we can consume intentionally, we can collaborate with other artists, and we can innovate in both the, the live performance spaces and the, the old classic arts and the new digital spaces, I think that there is a long road ahead of us, but it's a, it's a good road, right? And yeah, I believe, it's very exciting. And I, I look forward to, to seeing the artists around us and joining with them in trying to, you know, push the boundaries and um, explore that new terrain. And that's it. That's our show. Thanks for listening and joining with us today. Our logo design was by Dana Gray Studio. Our intro music was by me, Ray Hartsfield. Check us out on Instagram at decoding the creative all one word. Check out Ben's bands on Spotify, The Road to Milestone, and Avery. Take care of yourselves out there. Wear a mask, get a vaccine, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>